Welcome to our talk. We're going to be covering um, advanced model serving techniques with uh, Ray and Kubernetes. Um, so yes, uh, let's start with some quick intros. I'm Andrew Sai Kim. I'm a software engineer at Google working on um, GKE. And I've been <clears throat> um, contributing to and maintaining to, uh, the Kubernetes project for several years and in various areas. Um, and more recently, I've been um, uh, maintaining the Kubernetes project with Kaizen and helping um, Google Cloud customers uh, build modern machine learning platforms with Ray. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Kai Xun Chen. I am a software engineer in the Nscale. Uh, Nscale is a creator of Ray. And I'm in the Ray core team. And I maintain the Kubernetes project and uh, contribute to like, uh, Ray compile graphs and uh, some Ray core stuff. I think you can oh, yeah. Uh, I think AI is all around you that's, uh, in today's life. So uh, when you take an Uber, browse TikTok, listen to music on Spotify, discuss current events on Reddit, and watch video on Netflix. Uh, you all have already interacted with the AI built using Ray. So for scaling AI workloads, uh, Ray is almost everywhere. Yeah, so what is Ray? Uh, when we start to introduce Ray, we should start from the fundamental, uh, the Ray core. Uh, when we program on a laptop, we need to, the program consists of uh, three elements. You need to define function, you need to define the class, and you need to define the variable. And the record provides the distributed API that is one-on-one -on -one mapping with three elements. The red task is the remote function, and red actor is a remote class, and the red object is the remote variable, uh, which means that when you submit a Ray application in, across the cluster, it will launch this class uh, function and a variable across the cluster, and they can interact with each other, and you don't need to worry uh, which, uh, where is this like, uh, function class variable is running on which node. Yeah, so this means that it's pretty easy to convert your Python program into a distributed program because the pattern is pretty, very similar. And uh, the record goal is to make users program in a distributed system as if they were working on their laptop. Yeah, so the record slogan is like the uh, infinite laptop. Yeah, and uh, uh, this is a very simple record example. Uh, first, uh, you, just, you need to add an annotation on the function uh, so to declare that this function is a red task. And then you call the f.remote, and it will create a red task in the, in the red node, and it will return a non-blocking future. Uh, finally, you can call the red.get to uh, get to the final results from the cluster. And uh, you can see like, uh, it's a pretty simple example, and uh, you can parallelize the, the F, the, these two red tasks together. Yeah, so now that we understand what a Ray core is, and uh, this slide provides a high overview of Ray architecture and explains why it is popular in ML infrastructure. Uh, first, uh, Ray core is the fundamental uh, component of Ray. Uh, building on Ray Core, we build, the Ray community built several AI libraries, uh, including like Ray Data, Ray Chain, Ray Tune, Ray IOLib, and Ray Serve to cover a different workload to cover the end-to-end -end model lifecycle. And then uh, the community also offers the two deployment solutions. One is for Kubernetes, and the other one is for the virtual machines. And uh, the official solution for Ray and Kubernetes in the open source community is the Kubernetes. Yeah. And then, uh, why Ray is so popular in the ML infrastructure? I think the first point is that the Ray core API is pretty easy to use. A uh, user can parallelize workload with a few lines of code change. Right? If you guys have experience about like the MariDuce, you need to rewrite the program in the map function and reduce function, uh, which is uh, pretty different from the, your, your program in the laptop. And the second is that uh, Ray is uh, Ray supports the heterogeneous computing resource, like the GPUs from the different vendors, like the TPU, like the AWP neuron chip, like the NPU from Huawei, and the many, many different chips. And uh, the heterogeneous computing resource is become more and more important, especially for like the training and the batch inference. Yeah, and the third one is that uh, Ray Core is a very low-level API and it's very flexible. And the Ray also builds several AI libraries to cover the end-to-end lifecycle. So you can just use it to cover the internal life cycle and it's different workload have the different system requirement. For example, like a serving, you require the auto scaling and something like the higher ability. 
And for training, maybe you need to support the GAN scheduling. And for the battery inference, you need to support a heterogeneous computing resource. And you need to support like a streaming. And the race is very flexible, so it supports all of them. Yeah, and the last one is that uh, with the support of the with the support of the Kubernetes and the virtual machine, uh, you can almost deploy Ray on everywhere. Yeah, and the uh, next is that Andrew will dis, uh, will explain the uh, Ray on Kubernetes and uh, explain what is the model inference and uh, why model inference is important. Yeah, so when 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 it comes to deploying Ray on Kubernetes, um, uh, we have Kubray. So Kubray is an open source. Uh, Kubernetes operator for Ray. Uh, it provides declarative um, uh, APIs or, or CRDs for managing Ray clusters, uh, jobs, and serving applications for inference. Um, Kubray is, is specifically a powerful tool because it helps bridge the gap between um, the infrastructure and platform engineers who are very familiar with Kubernetes with the data scientists, machine learning researchers who uh, don't want to deal with like, all the Kubernetes YAML and just want to focus on their research, uh, which is mainly done in, in a Python environment. Um, so yeah, in our talk, we're going to cover how Ray enables online inference and offline inference. And we'll also cover how Kubray kind of enables this in a reliable and, and production-ready um, way. So yeah, let's start with um, online inference. So online inference refers to the process of generating um, output tokens or predictions from a machine learning model in, in real time. So the, the common example that everyone's familiar with is your LLMs, right? Your chat, GPT, Gemini, Llama, and, and Claude. So serving all these types of LLMs is an example of, of online inference. Um, then we have offline inference, or often called batch inference. And as the name implies, batch inference involves generating predictions using larger inputs and often doing this in a, in a periodic manner. Um, so the, 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 and the, and the output of offline um, inference is often persisted somewhere for reference later. Um, and so this is different from online inference, where you're generating predictions and giving, the, giving it to users in real time. Um, and so often with um, batch inference, we care more about uh, the throughput and the cost of inference rather than uh, compared to online inference, where we actually care a lot about the latency of, the, uh, of inference. Um, some examples of batch inference can be uh, generating vector embeddings for RAG, where you take a bunch of text documents uh, containing important context, and then you store it into a, a vector database for context retrieval later when you do inference, real-time inference through LLM. Or let's say you want to build uh, you know, like a recommendation system for your website. Um, it doesn't always make sense to try to predict new recommendations in real time, but rather you'd run a periodic batch job that generates recommendations, and then you would cache that for later use uh, part of your application. So yeah, let's dive a little deeper into online inference. Um, so uh, online inference today has a, f a few common challenges. Uh, the first is uh, deployment complexity, right? So models today are becoming larger, which also means that they run on more expensive and then larger GPUs. And these models also take um, longer to start up, especially if you're pulling the model weights from like a, a remote bucket. Um, in addition, you often have to orchestrate the deployment of multiple mo models um, together um, to achieve the outcome of what you want out of your machine learning platform. And then putting this all together, it's really important to enable really fast prototyping and iteration, which is really important for you know, the researchers who want to iterate quickly on, on, uh, on the output of their models. Uh, and then there's also a framework complexity where different researchers may have preferences in the underlying framework, um, and that changes how you end up serving the models in production. And then lastly, it's, um, today it's challenging to fully optimize the performance and utilization and cost of running the latest and greatest models, um, especially with you know, really expensive hardware accelerators like GPUs. So this is where RaceServe kind of comes to the picture, and it tries to um, address many of these challenges. So RaceServe is a scalable model-serving library within the Ray project for building online, online inference APIs. Uh, it enables uh, fast prototyping. Um, much like Ray, start, really easy to start on your laptop and then you know, distribute the serving application to distribute a cluster on the cloud. And um, it's all done with Python APIs, so it's familiar with, with to uh, AI researchers. And then lastly, it comes with a bunch of advanced capabilities um, that are important when you want to actually stitch together the outputs of multiple models um, together, which we'll cover in more details later. So here's a really short, um, simple code snippet of how RayServe is used. You take your model code, you add a serve.deployment decorator, and now your model is considered a serve deployment. Um, then you can call the model with the serve.run, um, add a route prefix if you want, and just like that, you have a very simple API endpoint for your model. Uh, and in, in this example, we have a sentiment analysis model that takes some text. So in this example, it says, RayServe is great with an exclamation point. 
uh, and then it returns a label, which in this case is positive, and a score of 99. Uh, so yeah, RaceServe makes it easy to scale out to multi-model deployments. So specifically here, we have an example. It's called model multiplexing, where you can deploy multiple models uh, together and then multiplex traffic to different models based on um, an ID. Um, so one use case of multi-multiplexing could be that you run multiple models of varying sizes, and you want kind of finer grain control of uh, which models to use based on the type of question or the complexity of the question. Um, or if you just want to experiment with the outputs of different models, you can use um, this capability. And yep, here's a, just another example. It's really simple. You just add a Python decorator, and that does the multiplexing logic for you, and then you can pick um, the models to download and, and serve as part of your uh, RaceServe application. Uh, RaceServe also supports uh, model composition. Um, and this effectively allows you to chain um, the input and output of, of models together. Uh, we're actually short on time, so I'm going to skip some stuff here. So yeah, this is another code example um, where you can kind of chain the output of two serve deployments together. Um, and of course, yeah, none of this um, is actually possible without some sort of orchestration of the Ray cluster and the serve application. And so Kubrace supports a custom resource called Ray Service that lets you bundle together um, your serve application and your Ray cluster. Um, and this is an example we have in one of our guides. So you know, um, it's uh, public, so you can kind of try it out yourself. Um, and then, yeah, this is kind of an example using VLLM to um, serve um, any, really any model that you can download from Hugging Face. Right? So the important part of this example is on the right. There is this argument called workers use Ray. Um, and that is the default in VLLM. And this is important because VLLM uses Ray as the backend for distributed serving. So it's a lot easier to get started with VLLM when you have a Ray cluster already created by um, Keybray. And then lastly, a key benefit of RaceServe is that it kind of bridges the gap between um, model inference and your own business logic. Right? So we have an end user example from Samsara. And they were able to reduce their machine learning inference costs by 50% because RaceServe allowed them to uh, consolidate various uh, components together into a single RaceServe application where the business logic and the model inference are kind of sitting closer together and, and deployed together in a single uh, Ray cluster. And yeah, next, Kaisen will cover offline inference. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. Yeah, uh, in this session, I will talk about the uh, offline inference with Ray. Yeah. Uh, I think the uh, the challenge with the offline inference is that uh, the first is that it's pretty common for a batch inference workload to consist of both CPU and the GPU tasks. Uh, for example, like use CPU to do the I/O and uh, use the CPU to do the pre-processing and uh, use the GPU to do the model inference. Uh, second, uh, CPU tasks such as pre-processing, uh, I think it's common to generate like a very large intermediate results. Uh, for example, like image decoding may generate like a 10x larger. Uh, result comparing with the input. And the third is that uh, offline inference is typically needs to support the parallelism across multiple nodes. Uh, for example, like uh, we observed a pattern that of loading the CPU intensive task to the CPU nodes is a pretty common pattern for the, this kind of the heterogeneous computation. It will improve the throughput a lot and uh, save a lot of cost. Yeah. yeah, and uh, this is a uh, typical uh, batch inference job flow. You can see like the, the read, preprocess, and the set are the CPU intensive tasks. And the, the inference, model inference is a GPU intensive task. And then we take a closer look at the preprocess side. Uh, for example, if this is a, a deco decode, like the compressed image of vid or videos, and then it will generate like the very large intermediate results. Uh, like the JPEG is like the compression ratio is about like the 10x, and uh, for some video format is maybe around the 2000x. Yeah. So to solve this uh, very large intermediate result, uh, we have two solutions. The first one is that the naive solution is that write the intermediate result to the cloud storage or disk. Uh, however, it will add like a minutes of the overhead. And the second is the better solution is the streaming the intermediate data through the class memory to reduce the overhead that writing to the cloud storage. Uh, however, there are some issues for the streaming. Uh, for example, for the bulk uh, synchronous uh, parallel framework, such as like the uh, Meridus and Spark, it's hard to support the streaming. 
uh, the, the cause is that, uh, first is that a stage like in a Spark cannot consist of the both CPU and the GPU workloads at the same time. So it needs to split into a different stage. And the second part is that this kind of the framework like a Spark, it cannot support a streaming between the different stage. A stage must be start after it is dependency uh, finish the job. So uh, that's an issue that, in this case, if it's a heterogeneous uh, workload, it must need to write the large intermediate result into a disk. Yeah, and uh, Ray Data. Ray Data is the Ray Community uh, Batch Inference solution. It provides the streaming execution to avoid, with the streaming execution, you don't need to write the intermediate result into the disk or cloud storage. So it saves a lot of the overhead. Yeah, so uh, we finished the first, uh, first challenge is the heterogeneous. And the second part is for the model sharding. Uh, why model sharding becomes more and more important? Uh, the first part is that the model becomes uh, more and more larger. Uh, for example, like the, it's pretty hard to, for a single GPU node to, to serve a model like the Llama 3.1 of 405B, because if you use like FP16, it still requires 800 uh, gigabytes of the GPU memory. And the second is that for batch inference, the uh, cost is often uh, more important than the latency, and the model sharding unlocks the opportunity to use the low-end GPU to save the cost. Uh, this is for some background knowledge. If you are not familiar with like the model sharding strategy, like the pipe person and the test person, uh, you can see like the pipe person is that split the model based on the layer. So you can see like in this example, uh, the layer zero and the layer one puts on the GPU zero, and layer two and the layer three puts on the GPU one. And uh, for the tensor person, it split the weight in the same layer across multiple different GPU. So in this example, you can see like the 50% the of the weight for the layer zero puts on the GPU zero, and the, the other 50% of the weight puts on the GPU one. Yeah, these are the two popular model sharding strategies. Yeah, and the, the PyPy person also brought some new challenges. For example, uh, because like the uh, PyPy, because a different layer in the model have a different size, so, for example, if the layer zero is larger, it will occupy a, a single GPU zero, and the layer one and layer two are smaller. So both of them that uh, put on the same GPU one, and uh, so different stage have the different uh, layers and uh, have the different computation requirements, uh, which means that, and this is pretty hard to predict before we actually run the program. So the elastic auto scaling is pretty important. Yeah, and the rate auto scaling is pretty flexible. It supports the auto scaling in the actor and the rate actor and the rate. Uh, uh, it is support the auto scaling like in the rate actor level. So which means that it can schedule, it can auto scaling based on the process. So it can pretty easy to support like the auto scaling in the uh, stage in the independently. So which means that if a, if a stage is faster than the other pipeline stage, uh, it can scale down and release the resource for the slower stage. And uh, this is hard to support in like the like a bulk synchronous uh, parallel framework such as Spark, because I think a Spark the auto scaling support doesn't support the stage label auto scaling. Yeah. And uh, in the Kubernetes community, it's also offer uh, the other CRD and the Raydrop CRD is to help to productionize the batch workloads. And the Raydrop CRD is equal to the Ray cluster CRD plus a Kubernetes job. It will provision a Ray cluster and submit the Raydrop to the cluster. And then it will monitor the job status and uh, auto -clean, automatically clean up the computing resource after it's finished. And then the uh, underlying uh, underlying Ray cluster also support the uh, auto scaling. Then uh, the Ray job also support the uh, advanced scheduling with Q, Volcano, and the Unicorn, some popular uh, schedulers. Yeah, this is the, just something like uh, it will 
automatically clean up the resource. Yeah, and uh, there are some uh, end user story, uh, like eBay. eBay gave a presentation in the May 2024 about their battery and friends story. Uh, this, is, this workload is the uh, image uh, embedding generations. They, they use Ray to put the preprocess on the CPU nodes and uh, the embedding generations GPU inference on the GPU nodes. And uh, it's increased the GPU utilization by 4x with a Ray data streaming execution and the Ray fractional GPUs and the Ray and the Qubit auto scaling. Yeah, and the second end user story is about ByteDance. Like, uh, ByteDance has uh, published an engineering blog about how do they use uh, Ray data to do the batch inference with their 200 terabytes data um, multi model large language model inference. Yeah, and the, the next session is that I will introduce the Ray Compile Graph. Uh, I think uh, this is the new announcement in the Ray Summit 2024. It's a, and uh, this, it, uh, this API is currently in the alpha status, so welcome for the feedback. Yeah, uh, as in one sentence is that uh, Ray Compile Graph are 10 to 20x faster than the Ray Test, and uh, also support uh, GPU native communication, such as Nickel, for static task, test graphs. Yeah, so to understand the optimization, we need to understand how does the default execution for Ray Core. Uh, Ray Core very encourage the dynamic execution. So you can see in this example, uh, first is that we create two Ray actor, A and B. And then, uh, and then we want to pass the hello, the, the string, to the actor A, and uh, pass the output of the actor A to the actor B. So the first is the driver writes the a hello into the shared memory, and then send the RPC to the actor A to tell where is the input argument. So the actor A read the input, then after the actor A finish the computation, it writes the output to the shared memory, and then the actor A send an RPC back to the driver to tell where is the output. And then because the output needs to pass to the actor B, so driver send another RPC to the actor B, to tell where is the input argument, so it reads the input, so on and so forth. And then the finally, we call read.get to get the final result. So uh, I think the detail is not that important. The important part is that you can see that the RPC is a bottleneck. There are a lot of RPC. Yeah, so to summarize the previous the default execution of record, uh, the first is that uh, we need to allocate the memory for each, allocation, each execution. And the second is that the driver needs to tell the Red Hat where is the input argument. And the third one is that the Red Hat needs to send back to the driver where is the output. So uh, what is the ideal situation? The ideal situation is like a Red Compact Graph. The first is that it's allocate the memory once and then re during the compilation and then reuse it for the multiple executions. So you don't need to allocate the memory every time. And the second is that it will tell the actor where to read the data. So you don't need to send an RPC to tell the, uh, to tell the actor where to read the input argument. And the third one is that a rate has to write output to the same place. So driver always watch the same place. So it doesn't need to another RPC for the actor to tell the driver where is the output. Yeah, and uh, this is uh, some benchmark. You can see there are some like a uh, single node and the multiple nodes, and uh, like uh, some round trip. You can see it's like, around like uh, maybe 10 to 20x. And, uh, and this is for the shared memory. And uh, the second part is for the uh, GPU. If you want to transfer a GPU to another GPU, uh, uh, at first in the default record execution is that you need to copy the GPU from, need to copy the tensor from the GPU to the, to the sender's heap memory in the CPU. And then you need to like, uh, serialize and uh, like, uh, put it into the after store, share memory. And then the receiver needs to uh, read, the, read, the, read the tensor from the share memory and then copy it to the GPU. So there are a lot of uh, data copies. We, although we do some optimization about to support like, a little copy, 
but there are still another like a serialization, deserialization. It's still a lot of data copies. So with the with the recompile graph, we support uh, some like a P2E protocol such as a Nico easily. So you can use a Nico directly to send the, the tensor from GPU zero to GPU one. Yeah, and uh, this is the this is a very simple example. Uh, I just want to showcase that the API is pretty simple. You just need to specify the transfer equal to Nico, and uh, it can support uh, this. And uh, we also build the execution schedule for for the users, so you don't need to worry about the deadlock caused by the Nico. And uh, this is an other use case. Uh, the VLM support the two backend. One is for the multiprocessing. The other is built by the Ray. And uh, and uh, we utilize the Ray, uh, the VLM Ray backend with the Ray compile graph to reduce the overhead from the two to three millisecond to the 100 to 200 microsecond. And uh, we also implement the tensor person and the pipe person uh, in the VLM. And all of them have already been merged to upstream. And uh, this is some benchmark. Uh, we compare the Ray compile graph with the multi-process implementation rather than the Ray original Ray implementation. We still got the better performance result. Yeah. And next, uh, Andrew will talk about the uh, DRA. Yeah. So um, next, I'll cover how we plan to integrate um, Cuberay with the latest. Um, dynamic resource allocation API that is being actively developed in the Kubernetes community. Um, so first, we want to explore leveraging the new uh, DRA APIs in Kubernetes for GPU time slicing. So GPU time slicing is very similar to how multiple processes would share uh, CPU time. So each worker, each Ray worker gets a slice of GPU time, and when it's occupying the GPU, it gets full access to the GPU, and it, it doesn't share that with any other um, task or actor in the cluster. So while not ideal for online inference where you care a lot about the latency, uh, you can imagine some uh, interesting use cases for offline or batch inference where you really care about fully utilizing all the GPUs that you have and the latency is, that, is not, not that important. Um, so uh, this is some example YAML for how we envision this integration to work. So first you create a resource claim API or a resource claim template, um, which is tied to a device class. Um, and the new DRA API allows you to specify um, device-specific parameters, which in this example is leveraging the time slicing strategy that's available for NVIDIA GPUs. Um, and then you uh, specify the resource claim in the plot template that's used uh, in, the, in the Ray cluster, which can also be referenced in the Ray job or the Ray service. Um, similarly, we want to look into GPU space sharing. So this involves dividing the GPU resources or virtualizing the GPU in, um, amongst many Ray actors and tasks. And this involves um, simultaneous consumption of GPU. So there's no context switching required to access um, across the um, distributed Ray cluster. Um, and uh, space sharing can be viable for online inference since there's no context switching between GPUs. And space sharing allows you to run um, many smaller models on a, on a single uh, accelerator. And so it gives you a lot more flexibility on like, how you want to you know, utilize the GPUs that you already have. Um, so similar to the time slicing example, um, we would leverage the new ability to pass in um, device-specific parameters to enable um, NVIDIA space partitioning. And similarly, we would reference the resource claim in the pod template um, of the worker pods. Um, so it's also worth noting that Ray itself also supports um, fractional allocation of GPUs across its actors and tasks. And so we want to explore c combining Ray's ability to do fractional GPU resource allocation with DRA to unlock new ways to fully control um, the utilization and consumption of GPUs and, and other hardware accelerators. Um, and likewise, we can start thinking about how to use DRA in conjunction with techniques that Kaisen covered, like tensor parallelism and pipeline parallelism. Um, to enable finer grain control over GPU performance and utilization when you're trying to um, serve LLMs with uh, VLM and, and Ray. So yeah, that covers kind of the main parts of the talk. Um, so let, let's summarize the, the key points quickly. So first, we introduced Ray, a unified open source compute framework for distributed machine learning. Ray provides a model serving framework called RayServe that makes it really easy to build um, online inference APIs with your models. Ray also has a library called Ray Data for offline and batch inference, which often um, requires heterogeneous um, compute resources. 
Uh, the Ray project recently developed um, Ray compile graphs, which enables uh, native GPU to GPU communication, which significantly improves um, performance uh, of techniques such as tensor parallelism and pipeline parallelism, which are um, used um, uh, in inference engines uh, such as uh, VLLM. Um, and all these techniques in Ray, uh, combined with Kubernetes DRA, will unlock new ways to optimize the inference performance uh, utilization and, and, and cost. And then lastly, um, Kubray is the Kubernetes operator that enables all of the above um, uh, in your production Kubernetes environment. Um, so yeah, before we end the talk, um, we have a few shameless plugs. Uh, first, we encourage folks who are using Ray and Kubray to join the community. There is a Ray community Slack uh, with a few channels dedicated to Kubray users, and you can ping myself or Kaishin there to discuss anything related to Kubray. Um, we also have a biweekly um, Kubray community meeting, um, and we welcome folks to join and help us uh, drive Kubray in, in, in the right direction. No. Oh. Yeah, the final is the uh, advertisement. Yeah, the NScale is uh, also a sponsor for the KubeCon this year, and uh, we have the uh, booth in the S43. And uh, the NScale is a creator of Ray, and uh, we have some expert about the NScale and the Ray. And uh, if you are interested in Ray and the NScale, you can just uh, visit our booth, and uh, we have some fancy swag about like Ray. Yeah. So uh, yeah, thank you for listening. Great. Thank you. I think we have uh, three minutes for questions. Yeah. Oh. Oh, I, I think. Uh, there's oh, there's a, a mic there, there's so you have to there. line up for the mic. So. Uh, or, or maybe we can repeat it. So, Michael. Okay, can you try now? Hello? Yeah, there we go. okay, okay. Yeah, thanks for the deep dive. The results were promising. Uh, so, firstly, a quick comment, right? Very nice to see the DRA integration. I'm wondering, and, uh, have you thinking about looking at uh, even like the MIG, the hard physical partition of the GPU or layered and the sharing thing? And also a comment, we are going to present some of the GPU sharing benchmark study tomorrow. So for those who are interested, yeah, please come to our session. So I have two quick and high level questions. So firstly, for people like me without deep knowledge of Ray, can you quickly high level comment and uh, like the Ray, KServe, and NVIDIA Triton? So what's the relationship or the key difference between them? Do you want to take uh, that? Yeah, I think for the... You, you can see like a Triton, I think, in my mind, I think Triton is the inference engine. You can see like the reserve is the architecture. It's just help you to like serve the model and like a route the router request. And you can use everything that is support Python uh, that's uh, with the reserve together. And I think with the KServe, uh, honestly, I don't use the KServe, but I think the KServe is more like the microservice architecture and maybe it's a better integration with like the Kubernetes native auto scaling, something like that. But I think for Ray service that it's pretty feasible. For example, you can run multiple models in a single container, and you can also scale the different replica, and uh, and I think uh, uh, and I think it also support like the Ray have is auto scaling, so you can see and it has a better programmability. Yeah, so I think like a K service like a support like a Kubernetes ecosystem maybe better, but the Ray service has the more feasibility and the programmability. And you can put a lot of different things like across a cluster. Yeah, if a more fair comparison with Triton would be like VLM and RayServe is like the model serving framework, and you can wrap like the VLM uh, uh, with with um, RayServe. Okay, a second uh, high level question. You mentioned the two different deployment model, right, on top of Kubernetes and the virtual machine. Yeah. Can you elaborate a little bit about the pro and the cons, and also their adoptions? For example, how many users already use um, Kubernetes? How many virtual machine? Thank you. God, I, I think for the, I, I think in our product side, we support both the virtual machine and the Kubernetes. I think a virtual machine is that we have more control, yeah, but I think, I think more advancement. And I think Kubernetes is that you can leverage the Kubernetes ecosystem, like the Prometheus, a lot of different stuff, and the some ingress stuff. And uh, I, I think in the open source side, I think the Kubernetes is dominant. Yeah, but if you want to optimize and customize yourself, maybe you need to start from the VM. It's better. Uh, but I think it depends on Yeah, I mean, your we, we are at KubeCon, so definitely use Kubernetes. So. OK, thank you. All right. I think I recognize you from college, so it's cool to see you giving a talk here. Okay. Uh, but uh, I, um, I work on Kaido. Uh, it's a new project at Microsoft, which is also 
Kubernetes operator to run AI workloads similar to Kubray. Uh, my question was that given, given that Ray has its own scheduler uh, that's, that's already running and then Kubray is running on Kubernetes, Kubernetes has its own scheduler, could you talk about like the performance there? Because my understanding is that Ray was developed to be its own standalone, like you were talking about Ray uh, core and then compiled graph, it's developed to be its own standalone system and now Kubray is running on top of Kubernetes, right? So could you talk a little bit about the performance and, and the resource efficiency there? Uh, you, you say the, the performance for what? Uh, which perspective of the performance you are interested in? So I, my understanding is you have like two schedulers going on. You have the Ray scheduler yeah, yeah, yeah. and you have the Kubernetes scheduler. So yeah. my, my guess is there's some overhead there because Ray was intended to be ran standalone, right? So could you talk about the if there's a drawback there, or the, the resource utilization or performance, how that's impacted by using Kubray? Um, yeah, I, I think the, uh, I am not quite understand the, the performance, but I guess it's maybe for the scheduling part. I think for Ray scheduling, I think, it's, I think it will be very fast. You can think, because it's just launch a process in a running container. So it doesn't need to provision the container, doesn't need to provision the node. Yeah, so I think maybe it's pretty fast. Yeah, I'm not sure if this is your question or not. So I think the important distinction is that like when you run Ray on Kubernetes, uh, each work, each Ray worker is not a VM, it's a pod, right? Um, and so there's still like two tiers of scheduling. Ray handles the actor task scheduling on the workers, and then Kubernetes handles like the pod scheduling for the Raylet. So and Ray so, is treating each pod as a VM? Is that uh, yes, yeah, basically. Yeah, and so performance is, uh, it, it just depends. Like Kubernetes, if you use Ray on Kubernetes, you have all the advanced scheduling capabilities that come with Kubernetes. So you could actually increase your cluster performance by using like topology or scheduling, grouping, you know, a specific type of GPUs closer together, things like that. Whereas on VMs, you kind of have to just manage all that yourself. So it just depends on like how you deploy Ray. Thank you. Hey, it's good to have you in Utah. Um, so I can see how Ray, helps with performance at serving time. Like it helps you get like, get more out of your GPUs, handle more like throughput and stuff. Um, and, and, and some of the other tools out there also do like Bento ML and, and NVIDIA Triton. And so like one, with all these tools, one thing that I've struggled with is helping the data scientists find an ergonomic way to sync the training logic, like the pre-processing that they're doing in training with the pre-processing they're doing in serving. Cause like if you train a model and use pre-processing logic A, but then accidentally use preprocessing logic B at serving time, it like invalidates it. Like does Ray have facilities to help sync those two? Like just to make the transition from training to serving like ergonomic? Are you say for the for preprocessing to training? Yeah, like if I'm a data scientist, I'm probably iterating on my preprocessing logic and probably like like maybe maybe sometimes I'm tinting images red, sometimes I'm tinting images blue. And when I transition that to serving, I want to make sure if I tinted it red at training time, I tint them red at serving as well. Like anyway, and it's just been hard to like coordinate those versions across training and serving time. And I think, I think that is like an ergonomic failing of some of the serving tools. So I was just wondering if, if Ray has any like recommended work, workflows or facilities for like getting that tracking right. Um, I think that because I think Ray is pretty programmable. So um, I think it's pretty easy to achieve that. And uh, you can think, I think there's a bug like from the Niantic, like the company behind the Pokemon Go. They said that after they moved to the Ray, I think their code reduced uh, 70%. Okay. So I think uh, Google of this different stage together is the, what the Ray do the best. So it, I think what I'm hearing is Ray, like other serving frameworks, is pretty unopinionated about how you track that version. So it's, it's still sort of up to you to figure out what the workflow is to, to sync them. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we don't. I think we are the, you can see the record is pretty lab, low level IP, API, comparing with like a Spark core API. I think pretty yes. low level. And so I guess in that case, one recommendation is if people haven't looked at Bento ML, Bento ML like can deploy on top of Ray, but like has some facilities for doing for packaging the model together with the preprocess. Anyway, so okay, something to think cool. about. Cool. Thanks. Hello. Uh, great presentation. Um, so I have a question. W what is your strategy uh, to reduce the cold start time when the Ray cluster tries to acquire a new node when it tries to order scales? Because uh, from my benchmarks, it's at eight minutes right now. Uh, even with using uh, bottle rocket AMI uh, baked into the node, can you? Yeah, yeah so I think for, for ephemeral clusters because having static clusters is 
Very yeah, expensive. yeah. I think for um, cold startup, it's just going to depend on like what your cloud and like uh, how you're deploying your clusters, right? So. Um, if you're just like deploying models and you're downloading from Hugging Face every time, yeah, it's going to take you like 10 minutes to download like Llama 7 to be or something like that. Um, I know like specifically on GKE, we have a lot of different ways to pull models faster. Um, you can use like GCS Fuse to mount like the model weights in a bucket directly into your container, um, or you can um, uh, cache the actual model weights on a disk and then mount the disk on every node. And so like. There's kind of many different approaches that you could take. It, it'll depend on like what cloud provider you're using and, and what you have available. Well, um, so the specific uh, use case is, uh, so I'm trying to build like ephemeral uh, ray, cl ray training clusters, like on-demand uh, data scientists uh, provision ray, ray training jobs. When they're done, that node just dies away, saves a lot of money. Um, but the problem is when Ray Cube Ray tries to auto scale and tries to acquire a new G5 instance, for example, on AWS, it takes it it takes about eight to ten minutes just to get that node ready, and that's before running right. any kind of uh, right. Yeah. So if you're like using Cube Ray auto scaling in conjunction with like you know EKS auto scaler or GK auto scaler, like that node startup time is like kind of out of like we can't do anything about that. That's kind of up to the provider. Um, but yeah, but yeah, like I think uh, after the node starts up, there are like, like I mentioned before ways to like pull the image faster, or pull, like you can cache an image on the node beforehand or things like that. But yeah, on the node startup time, like there's there's nothing we do special like at the Cubray level to improve that. Got it. Yeah. Thanks.